Norton, New Zealand's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, makes a preliminary visit to the Meet New Zealand exhibition at the Academy Cinema in London. Examples of the Dominion's products, with pictures and models, were on show. The exhibition was opened by the Secretary of State for Commonwealth Relations, Mr. Noel Baker. The purpose of the exhibition is to let the men and women of this country see what New Zealand is like. To make them realize, so far as you can, by photographs and in other ways, something of its natural beauty, of its agricultural development, and of its industrial future. As a tribute to the greatness of New Zealand, I declare this exhibition open. The ancient art of making stained glass windows, which reached its peak in Europe in the Middle Ages, is now practiced in New Zealand. This fine window, telling the story of the Good Samaritan, was created by a Dunedin artist, John Brock. Here is Mr. Brock completing a full-size drawing, the first step in the creation of a stained glass window. When this is finished, a tracing is made of the lead lines. This is used as a guide by the craftsman who cuts the glass. An ordinary wheel glass cutter is used. The basic colour effects are built up from a multitude of small pieces of white and coloured glass. The finer details of shading and features are hand tinted at a later stage. The shaped pieces are laid out on a sheet of plate glass in their proper positions. Hot wax is dropped between the joints to hold the pieces in place. The hole is then placed to the light for the final shading and painting. When these finishing touches are completed, the pieces are placed on a tray to be fired in the kiln. This process fuses the added colours into the glass. Lead, which holds the window together, is channelled before the reassembly begins. Joints are then soldered. The window section completed, it's polished and left to harden for a few days. When completed, there'll be another window to add light and colour to a New Zealand church. Now on her maiden voyage is the motor vessel Port Napier, and most appropriately, it's at the Port of Napier she's loading the bulk of her first homeward cargo. Her specialty is frozen meat, and with a capacity of half a million carcasses of lamb, she's one of the world's largest meat carriers. The meat comes from the local freezing works in insulated vans, thick cork insulation, and an air jacket keeping the temperatures well below freezing point. Small coastal vessels specially fitted with an insulated hold bring meat from the Tolaga Bay works and discharge directly to the Port Napier. <music> Along with frozen lamb and boned beef are going 22,000 boxes of butter. This too is brought to the wharf in freezer vans. Keeping frozen cargo frozen while loading in hot weather calls for quick handling. Air temperatures are over 80 degrees, but the cargo must be kept well below freezing point. It 
may be a sweltering day on deck, but in the ship's hold, water siders are working in 14 degrees of frost. This low temperature is necessary to prevent any deterioration of the meat or butter. Down here, you wear your winter woolies in midsummer and think of ways of keeping your feet warm. Nerve center of the ship's refrigeration system is the freezer engine room. From here, the chief refrigeration engineer controls the temperature in the holds. By means of remote reading thermometers, he can find out instantly the temperature of each one. In the Port Napier, forced draft air circulation has largely replaced the older system of piped brine. Present indications are that we'll have a record production season. To date, meat and dairy produce is 10% up on last year, but Britain still wants more food. If we provide the food, Britain with vessels like the Port Napier will provide the ships. Mm -hmm.